Pora Kays, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? I am wonderful. It is so great to be with you today. You're joining us from the Bay Area. Uh, and it's interesting, you're you're from Ireland and working for an organization called IDA Ireland. We'll get into that in a little bit and you can describe what it is you do, um, but your your office is in the Bay Area. Um, so it's, it's fun to get a little bit of a mix of perspectives uh, from where you're located as well as with your background. Uh, I'm excited for the conversation today. We're going to be focusing on the U.S. tech industry and really what companies in 2021 need to be doing and thinking about as they ramp up following the global pandemic. I know this is something that so many organizations are wrestling with and trying to, to figure out. Uh, we've been through a really hard 14, 15 months, and now we're kind of, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Things are starting to shift back, uh, but things have changed uh, and things aren't going back to the way they were. And so we have to continue to, to push forward and prepare for an uncertain future. So it, this will be a fun conversation. As we get started, I just wanted to share Porik's bio with everybody. Porik Hayes heads US West Coast operations at IDA Ireland, the investment agency of the government of Ireland. He has spent 15 years advising leading technology and life science companies from across the U.S. on global expansion projects. Over 1,200 international companies currently use Ireland as their international hub, including many of the world's most innovative and successful companies across technology, life sciences, and financial services. Ireland is also increasingly the go-to location for fast-growing companies internationalizing for the first time. Prior to joining IDA, Porek was part of the Irish team of a leading German financial services company. He also spent eight years in marketing and consultancy roles within the technology and financial service sector across Europe. Uh, again, wonderful background. I'm super excited for the conversation. Anything else before we get started with the conversation that you would like to share with listeners by way of your personal background, uh, your personal context? Uh, no, I suppose I, I sh the first thing I should do is correct my bio. It's probably a little bit out of date. It's actually 50, <laughs> 1,500 companies now oh, um, wow. that, that, that call Ireland their international home from home. Um, but yeah, look, so I've had a kind of a unique kind of career. The early part of my career was spent in Europe. I actually spent some time in, in, in kind of in, in recruitment and IT recruitment and working in tech. Uh, when many of your working on problems that many of your listeners wouldn't have heard of, such as the year 2000 bug and <laughs> the euro conversion um, projects, but I uh, have been in the US for the last 15 years um, at Silicon Valley for, 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 for almost 10. And uh, yeah, it's been an interesting time, I think, to be kind of at that intersection between technology and innovation and then what, what IDA does, which is, which is around international expansion. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I do remember Y2K bug, and I was actually in uh, Seoul, South Korea um, wow. that day, and I was so anxious to like, what's going to happen? Um, I actually went with some buddies. We hiked up the mountain for the the uh, millennial sunrise, and then kind of expecting to like walk back down and have like chaos ensue, and nothing yeah. happened. But <laughs> it was <Yeah>. good times. <laughs> I was in I was in a rural county Donegal, so even if the lights had gone out, I don't think we would have noticed because it was pretty pretty dark up there <laughs> up there anyway. Um, but but I do remember at the time I was in Frankfurt and we we worked I worked with a with an IT consulting company that um, was doing a huge amount of work with with the banks there. And like looking back, the amount of effort and time and consultancy and IT contractors and, and, and IT development that was done to, just in case this huge problem came at us. You know. Yeah, yeah, Su interesting super stuff. super interesting. You know, yeah. I, not the topic for the podcast today, but um, for another one maybe. For for all the run up to to Y two K and and uh, the the bug and the concerns. Uh, it kind of just got washed over pretty quickly as soon as we got past it and nothing yeah. really happened. Uh, I, I, you know, that, that's an interesting conversation to be had and like what, yeah. what we should learn from that. Anyways, we're both, we're both showing our age here, geeking out on uh, early 2000s, <laughs> late 99 technology, but there that's you right. go. Well, very good. So, so let's start by, um, if, if you, you've already described briefly, but if you could get into a little bit more about what IDA Ireland uh, specifically does and what you do uh, as you try to support firms that are internationalizing, um, we, we can start there. 
And then we can really start digging into, you know, really what organizations need to be thinking about as they're preparing, you know, for this post pandemic world. Okay. So yeah, so so IDA is the our, the Irish government's international investment agency, so our inward investment agency. And um, so we've we've been around for about seventy years. So um, Ireland, as an economy, is very much geared up towards helping international companies um, as a, as a, as a as a place to, to grow internationally. So uh, our role really is to partner with with companies from all around the world, large and small, and to help them uh, set up operations in Ireland to grow their international base. So Ireland in and of itself is a pretty small market, like we have a population of about 5 million people. So most of the companies that are there, they're there to serve their international markets, usually EMEA, Europe EMEA plus plus. Um, so we've got a team of offices all around the world. Um, the US is our largest market, so about 900 companies, about 70% of our business comes from the US. Um, and I'm based here in the West Coast. Our team here in the West Coast, uh, we've got offices in, in Mountain View in Silicon Valley. We've got, we've got people in San Francisco. We've got an office in Seattle and, and then also in, in, in Orange County. Um, and I guess our day-to-day -day role is, is kind of threefold. So, so firstly, we're, we're, we act as kind of a, an account management, a concierge service for the companies that are already in Ireland. So if you looked at the tech kind of the tech sector, you know, the history of technology in Silicon Valley or the, or the West Coast. You know, a lot of those companies, Apple, Intel, uh, Microsoft, a lot of those early investors into Ireland back in kind of the 80s and, and early 90s are still there. Now, obviously, what they're doing has, has changed uh, in many cases. You know, with, you know, technology has gone from kind of manufacturing through to, you know, um, manufacturing floppy disks and, and licensing software now to kind of cloud development and AI. So we work on a hand in hand with those companies to ensure that their teams in Ireland and their European teams are still kind of fit for purpose and, and, and that we're, you know, Ireland is positioned as a good place in terms of talent and infrastructure so that they can do what they want to do next. Um, I guess, secondly, our main job really is to act as kind of as, as an advisor um, and, and, and to help companies who are looking at that international process for the first time. Uh, so we work with you know, companies across technology, consumer, uh, life sciences, so both kind of medical and pharmaceutical companies and food companies, as well as international financial services companies who are, you know, growing, looking to maybe have customers in Europe, maybe looking to navigate that international expansion process. Uh, so we provide a range of free kind of supports and advice to help them through and navigate that. And I guess the fact that we've been doing this for so long um, and we work with so many companies We've built up a kind of a bank of expertise over the hundreds of different international expansion projects we work on every year. And um, so often what we find as well is because a lot of these companies are particularly the earlier stage companies, they're going through it for the first time. And um, there's a lot of kind of best practice that we help, uh, help kind of bring through. So, so I guess that, that's the kind of day to day role. We obviously as part of the government as well. We have kind of a representative role for business. So we're, we, we kind of, um, I guess we're business people who work for the government. Um, and we do also very much kind of keep our ear to the ground on what's happening here in Silicon Valley or in New York or in other kind of major hubs so that, you know, that, that, that filters then into what Irish policy, um, you know, how Irish policy around regulation, around talent development, around skills and education and training kind of go, uh, comes together. So, so yeah, so it's, so, so it's interesting and, and it's very much uh, about keeping our finger kind of on the pulse of, of kind of where the next kind of technology trends are going. We try and stay ahead of that. And then obviously the talent side of it is a huge part of that because the companies that are operating in Ireland, they're growing international teams there and we need to ensure that they have the right availability of that talent in order to be successful. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And it's interesting to me. So I, I'm curious, you know, what is it about the Irish talent pool that's attracting companies like Stripe, Salesforce, Google, other tech firms? Um, you, you've, you've referred to like many of the, the great things that IDA does uh, and the, the expertise, the track record. I think all that, of course, helps. Mm. But what is it specifically about the Irish talent pool um, that's able to support these businesses? Um, there, there's a few things. I, I, I guess there is that kind of muscle memory of, you know, in terms of the quality of the workforce, there is that muscle memory of, you know, 50 years of having 
worked with or had a base of a large base of US companies in particular, or, or US tech companies where there is there is a, a way of doing business, there's a there's a corporate culture, there's a there's processes and uh, and an expertise that's built up over time. So so there's that kind of deep track record as I said of, of, of as a place of, of you know supporting the US from from Ireland. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, in, t in terms of the, the actual people, there's a few things that, that, a few policy things that we put in place many years ago, which, which have helped in that. So we have a very young population. We're the youngest population in Europe. Um, a, a third of our, of our population is under the age of 25. Uh, and we have a pretty good education system. So we, about 55 to 60% of our kids graduate third level university. You, uh, university is free up to third level as well, which means we produce a lot of young, well-educated uh, people ourselves. Uh, but broader than that, I think the, the big thing about the Irish workforce is, it's that, is that it's not just Irish. So it is an international, very diverse, very international workforce. And I think that's what companies are looking for when they are going international. If you're global, you need a global workforce. You need, you need to be able to pull from uh, lots of different um, nationalities and, and, and expertise in lots of different markets. So I think that's it's one of the few locations globally where you can get a pool of such a such a very diverse pool of multifunctional, multilingual people. Um, so many of the companies I would have spoken about, for example, Facebook, uh, you know, have been in Ireland for, for kind of fifteen years. They have. They have, I think, uh, uh, coming up on 5,000 people there. And they've just announced last year, I think, that they've hit their 100th nationality in Ireland. So um, it's that kind of... It's um, amazing. It's that mix of... Yeah, it's, it's that mix of, of kind of, you know, you know that, that, that kind of young, talented workforce as well as, as well as the management expertise. So I guess, you know, the other kind of advantage to it is that, um, you know, a lot of companies, you know, when they're going overseas for the first time are looking to tap into markets you know, there's a pool of people who've kind of done that before. They've had, they've done the playbook. You know, so 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 that management talent. You know, if you're, um, you know, you know, one of one of the new companies that's just set up. We had a company last week, Tigera, um, which has set up in Ireland in, in Cork recently. They were able to to hire, you know, a, a manager who's been through the same process with with another U.S. tech company. Um, so and, and that's important, I think, especially for, um. You, you know, for an international operation, because uh, it is, a, you know, very, very different to doing business in the US. Um, I think that's one of the things that, that we we see companies maybe underestimating, particularly earlier stage companies, they under underestimate, you know, how quickly they can they can build up an expert, they can build up business in Europe without even knowing it. Um, and, and, you know, to do business in Europe, it's, it's obviously a very attractive market, but there's a lot of different uh, risks. There's lots of different markets and, and and things to take into account. So having that local expertise in one place to be able to build up is, is really important. I think Ireland over over many years, we've had a very um, being part of the EU has really helped because you've got free movement of labour across um, you know a population of 500 million people. But we've also been very smart about our immigration laws. We have made it very easy for companies to bring in people also from outside of of the EU. So if you're a US company, you want to bring a, a, a landing team uh, into Ireland for a certain period of time, you know, we have processes in place to be able to, to be able to help that. Yeah, I, I have to say I'm a little jealous about uh, the immigration situation in much of Europe and in Ireland uh, in comparison to the US. <laughs> we, we have many challenges here uh, in terms of uh, that diversified labor uh, pool uh, due to a variety of reasons, but the immigration policy being one of them. Um, anyways, I, I, I think that's so awesome. And like you said, a, a country of, you know, 5 million people, but with such a diversified workforce, a young workforce, a highly technical, uh, technically trained workforce, uh, that's, that's incredible and a wonderful opportunity for, for organizations globally. And in, in, in your case, specifically working with, uh, with, within the U S uh, to be able to move into international markets so let's let's go there next. Why global? Why why would a company want to go international? Um, you know, the U.S. is a huge market. Why why would they ever want to to go and expand into Europe, into Africa, into Asia, uh, South America, whatever? Um, and perhaps related to that question, what are some of the major 
pain points in Silicon Valley right now as we're kind of shifting and moving post pandemic? Um, well, well, I guess I think what we're seeing is that kind of going global is, is it's not often a choice anymore. I, I think it's, you know, companies are almost global from day one and, and they need to be kind of global from day one. So, you know, traditionally, I suppose, you know, IDA, we, we would have worked with, you know, large, multi, you know, the large American multinational. That was the, the, the kind of the traditional view. So a large company brings a, puts a factory somewhere or brings a large team over. Um, and that's clearly, you know, different now. So companies at a very, very early stage, you know, as soon as you switch on your servers, if they're available internationally, you can have customers, you have people who want to buy from you, they want to buy in their local currency, they, you know, then before you know it, you're coming across things like VAT and, uh, okay, now I need to hire some people somewhere in Europe. And now you're looking at complications around different labor laws and how I payroll them and tax them. So, so it, 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 there, there's both a push and a, and a pull. I think the push on it is, is also the fact that Europe is such a huge market. Like it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a very large lucrative tech savvy market. And, um, and I think, you know, in order to be successful globally, you need to crack that. And also what's happening, you would have seen it with, with a lot of companies is that if you don't get there first, then somebody else in Europe is going to come up with that idea and, and eat your lunch. So there's, there's both a, a push and a pull. The, the push being, you know, we need to get to that market quickly. We need to, we need to, there's revenue there. We need to win. And then the pull is that I've got customers who need to be served. And, you know, so, so, I, th so I think often it's not a case of, of, of if, but when. Um, and like I know, for example, you know, you know, even working, you know, looking at Airbnb back in the day, um, you know, th they very quickly had, had, uh, had, had kind of competitors pop up in Europe. They came up with this fantastic kind of model and idea. And you had these kind of clones or these other companies in Europe come up. And I suppose they were fortunate at the time that they, ver they very, very savvy management who were very, you know, I think that leadership team were very foresighted in, in what they wanted to do and how they went about it, but they also had the funding in order to be able to acquire some of those companies um, and, and, and kick that on. So um, most of the, of the investment we see when we're talking to companies um, is, is a mix of that, look, you know, that, 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 um, that, that, that kind of market, uh, go to market kind of uh, driven. Um, what I would say is that as well, you know, where it used to be the larger companies that, that were coming in, we now, like we work with on the West Coast of the US, a new company about every two weeks that's set up, setting up an operation in Ireland. And about half of those companies would have less than kind of three, 400 people globally. So usually kind of the sweet spot we see is that where kind of um, series B, companies raised maybe 20 to 50 million, series B, They've probably put some feelers on the ground. They might have a couple of people in, in, in the UK or, or other markets. And then um, they really see that they need to, they need to kind of switch and, and, and flick on that international. And that's where they, they, they start to kind of put, put serious bodies on the ground. I think if you look at some of those companies as well, you'll see that, you know, about 25 to maybe 25 to 35% of their revenue is already international, is ready from outside of the US by the time they hit that kind of, that mark and um, so, so 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 there's that side of it in terms of uh, I guess Silicon Valley you know I, I I I wouldn't say that there's really kind of a pain point I think it's a it's, it's a good they're good they're good issues to have to a certain extent but we certainly see like huge growth in Silicon Valley there's huge money going into um, going into tech in particular there there are huge there's a huge number of companies that are growing um, Okay, there, there is kind of some strange things going on around SPACs and, and different funding models and, 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 and things like that. But my point is, I suppose there's, there, there's, there's growth and there's buoyancy and COVID, funnily enough, um, for some companies has meant a huge boost in digitization, which, which means that there's, you know, there's actually more business for them than, than ever before. Um, but with that then also comes scaling challenges and you know, there is, um, there, there, there's a war for talent here in, in the Valley in the US and globally, uh, particularly when it comes to software engineering, anything around AI or machine learning or, or software data science. Um, there just isn't the, the, the supply really in, in one location. And then also the cost um, both of, of talent here and also the cost of living. Um, I think 
you know, for, for the larger companies, it's manageable. I think for a lot of the smaller companies, a lot of startups, they're just really struggling. Um, again, to build scale, quick, scale quickly, to go to market quickly, they're really struggling to be able to build teams out in that environment. You throw COVID in there where people are, have realized that they can, they can kind of work remotely um, has meant that, you know, companies are looking further and further afield for that talent. Um, like, so we would have seen probably, you know, traditionally the types of teams that we've been, we've been seeing ramp on up has been go to market. So sales, customer support, operations, compliance, back office, that kind of stuff. Traditionally, we, we've seen a lot more now software engineering and, and, and technical and innovation skills coming into Ireland. So almost 50% of our projects from the West Coast last year were innovation led. And I think that is also a driver of that, that kind of that war for that kind of tech, technology talent. Um, but definitely it's, you know, the last year we, we noticed with COVID, you know, when it first hit, um, the tech companies here on the West Coast were the first to go remote. I think even before, you know, it was, it was really prevalent on the East Coast. I remember talking to some of my colleagues in, in New York at the time who were thinking, look, yeah, it's, I know that there's some rumors of some, some weird virus, but we're not actually seeing a huge difference. Whereas a lot of the tech companies here had gone remote um, a, a lot earlier. So uh, our job at the time, because all those companies have teams in Ireland as well, our, our, our immediate job was, look, we need to make sure that, you know, they're going to be able to keep the show on the road. They're going to be able to keep the lights on. They're going to be able to get their people still in to be able to work. And I think most of the companies in, in Ireland did pretty well, actually, on it. We were able to support them to, 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 to switch to remote pretty quickly. Um, and able to manage a lot of the uh, kind of, you know, we supported business who, who, who you know, we, we had our, our, our kind of support for business the same way we had over here. Um, but I think then after a while, what we saw is that, you know, companies started because again, a lot of them were, were you know, were, were uh, taking advantage of the fact that that online utilization just went through the roof. So they were busier than ever, they were trying to scale. So we actually then around summer last year, we saw a lot more companies talking to us again, trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I, I actually need to grow. I've got business in Europe. How do I do this in a post, you know, remotely? So we were able to switch like a lot of our kind of due diligence support to, to remote meetings and to remote due diligence. Um, and like a lot of the companies that we work with are, 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 are growing out there. And um, I think now the challenge we're seeing both here and in Europe is what does that look like post COVID, right? So you've got Definitely, I think, you know, hybrid is the new buzzword that everyone is, is talking about. I think, there, you know, flexibility is, you know, a must for companies and for employees and as retention strategies. Um, there's opportunity in that. It allows companies to, uh, you know, to pull from a, a, wider, a wider pool, uh, which they're taking advantage of. I think it's probably going to have some effect on cost and things like that. I know that people here in the Bay Area, for example, are moving to places like, Idaho and Utah and, and, and other places and further afield and you know companies are paying them less to do that I think that, that, that that's one thing but the other challenge then is you know th there is a secret sauce kind of about you know in terms of creativity particularly for innovation of having people together in an office so how do you manage that um, so that you keep that flexibility that people are looking for but also are able to um, you know, you're able to make sure that people are in an office environment in some shape or form. So I think we're seeing that hybrid in, 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 in Europe and in Ireland, we're seeing companies, you know, we have supported remote working with companies actually for quite a while. So like Amazon, Apple, companies like Shopify would have had remote working teams in Ireland. So they would have had, they have their hubs, but they also have a lot of people working from, uh, from their home office. So that's something we've supported for a while. And um, I think the challenge in Europe as well is where you have, um, because you know the, the 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 risks of having a very diverse or very dispersed kind of workforce is there are, you know, in 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 EMEA there's a hundred hundred odd country, countries, you know, that you might be supporting from your European hub or from your EMEA hub, you know, you can't really have a hundred different payroll systems, a hundred different labour law systems. So so there are compliance issues and compliance um kind of risks that companies do need to do need to look out for when they're when they're allowing for kind of a, a dispersed team internationally uh, so i think what we're seeing is we're seeing companies look at the different hubs where they want to where they're comfortable to have people hubbing out of so they're looking at different locations where they've got the right infrastructure they've got the right um let's say legislative framework where there's business friendly kind of operations and then they're they're managing that 
Um, but yeah, but it's really interesting at the minute to see how um, how that is that is going to work out. I, th I think Ireland has probably done you know quite well. Um, you know, in terms of the, the the numbers, like international investment dropped by about forty percent globally last year. So foreign direct investment dropped dropped a huge amount. Ireland's share of that actually held up pretty well. Um, I think a lot of that was because there's that familiarity with Ireland, there's that track record, and people couldn't travel, but they knew, look, you know, I, I know what I'm going to get in Ireland. There's there's a there's a, a very solid workforce, there's a pro business kind of environment. So we were able to support companies to, to scale those teams uh, globally. Um, and, and remotely. That is all incredibly fascinating. Um, and my goodness, there's so much more that we have to discuss, yet I recognize we're about out of time. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I think what this means is if you're ever willing, I would love to have you back so we could continue to dissect this because there's so much that you just said that I think would really be wonderful to dig into. Um, but just to, to recap and summarize a little bit from some of the main points, uh, because, I mean, largely due to the pandemic, we've seen an acceleration towards more uh, distributed virtual workforces across the globe. Now that certainly was already happening, uh, but it just, we just pushed further faster um, due to the pandemic. Coming out of the pandemic, that's not gonna change. And, and you made the comment a few minutes ago about, you know, I asked the question, why go global? Why internationalize? And you made the point. It's a really important point that, you know, it's it's not a matter of if, but when. And we are all global already. Like you said, if, if you have a, a web presence and you're selling, you're international, you have to figure out your your channels, you have to figure out your your workforce. And there is a huge fight for talent, especially for STEM fields, technical fields. We just, in the U.S., we simply don't have enough labor and and so now people are more and more comfortable than ever before with with a virtual distributed workforce let's leverage the the talents and the the human capital that's across the globe we don't have to restrict ourselves geographically particularly in a place like the bay area that's so crazy expensive in terms of cost of living in terms in terms of um, the labor market like we can tap in all over the world. And so your organization is one of many that's helping organizations to do that. And it's, it's very, very important as we come out of the pandemic that we, we strategize and wrestle with those realities and figure out what our organization is going to do to another point that you made about, you know, making sure that we're still getting that secret sauce of the culture, the innovation, uh, all those things that we need to have as we're balancing a hybrid workforce, you know, uh, in, in the office team with distributed remote workers from across the globe. Uh, these are things that we're going to con continue to have to wrestle with and figure out what's going to make sense for our organization within our culture um, to drive value in the marketplace. Mm. I think you're right. Like, it's, a, it's a fascinating time. And I think it's also, I think it's a two way flow, definitely. I mean, it's not just, you know, from the US, but I mean, you know, there's as many people employed by Irish companies here in the US as there is the other way around. So there's that flow of European innovation, European companies who want to come to the US and they need to figure out how to be able to tap into the market here as well in order to do, to do business here. So uh, yeah, so look, I've, I've, I've probably rambled on quite a lot. Ask an Irish person to talk <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's what you get, but, it, but it's been really interesting. And I think, um, you know, certainly watch this space in terms of, of international, but uh, we, we definitely do see this. We, we do see companies will continue to want yeah. to, to grow globally. They will continue to want to tap into, into international markets and international workforce for that reason. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Porik, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. Before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, how they can get connected with IDA, find out more about what you and the organization can do to help them, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, look, I, I, I said, you know, uh, IDAIreland.com is, is our website, and we've got offices all over all over the world and over, over the U.S. Um, I guess we're, we're really keen to talk to anybody who is looking at that international um, journey and trying to figure it out. You know, we've got a we've got a uh, we've got a wide range of kind of supports and services to to help along the way. Um, and uh, yeah, look, just it's 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 a really interesting role we have. 
um, and we are we're, we're very uh, we're very keen to um, to, to, to kind of engage with, with with any companies that are that are looking at looking at Europe as their next step. Wonderful. Well, Pork, it has been a pleasure. I really appreciate your time. I encourage listeners to reach out to get connected, find out more about what you and IDA can do for them. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you have a great week.